Okay, in which case, um, we're going to get started. Uh, so tonight, uh, our lecture is delivered uh, by Dr. Charlotte Ward, uh, who is now a junior uh, clinic of clinical fellow in emergency medicine um, and had an unconventional route into medicine via a graduate entry medicine course, um, acquiring a place from her third application, uh, at which point um, I will hand over over to you, Charlotte. Um, yeah, over to you. Uh, thanks, Zach. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, monthly lecture series tonight uh, from BSMS. Um, thank you to the outreach team for inviting me to speak. And thank you all for coming. My name is Charlotte. I am working in a and &E. I'm a doctor there and I'm interested in emergency medicine and health inequalities. So this evening, I'm going to be talking to you about overcoming obstacles in medical school applications and beyond, with a focus on disadvantaged backgrounds and imposter syndrome. So this talk is primarily aimed at people looking to apply to medical school, especially those who would class themselves as from disadvantaged backgrounds, but it is open to anyone in healthcare because the themes discussed today go beyond medical school applications and are present within medical school and beyond. They might be affecting you now, or you might be somebody who's in a position to support somebody who's affected by these issues, or you might be someone who's in a position to act as an advocate for change in this area. So I'm just going to run through the content and framework of tonight's talk to begin with. So we're going to talk about why I've chosen to speak about this topic and why it is important. We're going to go on to talk a little bit about me and my path into medicine and hopefully find out a little bit about all of you too. We'll go on to define what it means to have a disadvantaged background and what the obstacles are when you apply for medical school. And we're going to talk a little bit about overcoming those obstacles, in particular, looking at imposter syndrome, overcoming setbacks, what resources and options are available to you and how to sell yourself. Then there'll be a quick summary and an opportunity to ask questions, but feel free to leave questions in the chat as well. So as we go along, I'll be using something called Menti. Um, so if you go to menti.com, and use the code on the screen. So that's 91887434. And that means we can have a little bit of interaction and you can answer some of the questions. Now the screen will have that background that you can see now, somebody typing. That'll be a little bit of a prompt to show that there's a question that you can join in on. Okay, so why have I decided to talk about this topic? So, the barriers of, of coming from a disadvantaged background have a huge impact on the person before medical school, during medical school and afterwards. And it's not something that's particularly acknowledged. And one of those barriers is imposter syndrome, and that can have a profound impact on somebody. And I've got personal experience in these areas, and I hope that this talk will help raise awareness of those issues, inspire some of you to overcome them, perhaps, and build some confidence. And I think talking about these issues is important because one of the ways we get over them is to acknowledge that they're there in the first place. So we can work towards having a more diverse and equal representation in our medical workforce. And it's really important to have a diverse representation in our healthcare. So first quick test of using Menti. Simple question, yes or no, do we think having diverse representation in healthcare is a good thing? So yes, everybody thinks it's a good thing, which is great. Um, okay, so why, why is it a good thing? What are the advantages of having increased, increased representation in healthcare? So it's really important for the demographic of the medical profession to mirror the population that it treats. We need people that represent everybody, especially when one of the biggest challenges that we face in modern medicine is health inequalities. And if we've got people within the medicine community that actually have had those lived experience, they're able to then help us overcome those barriers. It's essential that we have people that know what facing those inequalities looks like on the board of people that are making these changes. And on a personal level, it makes you more relatable to patients. There's a lot of documented testimonies from doctors from working class backgrounds, for example, who say, they feel it makes them more relatable to their patients and they can have a better bond with them. And that helps improve communication, trust, comfort levels. It's ultimately a brilliant thing for you and your patient. 
And more so, the profession, we need to get the most talented people, not the most rich or most affluent or the most experienced in terms of their family, but, you know, the most talented people. So it should be open to anyone to apply. OK, now we're going to go on to talk a little bit about me. OK, there's a big elephant on the screen because I wanted to introduce the elephant in the room. And that is that I am not the most disadvantaged person to be giving this talk. Uh, I'm white, I'm British, I appear able-bodied, I can come across as quite middle class. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, but I do have some experience of being a little bit disadvantaged. Okay, so I grew up in a quite a working class area. Uh, neither of my parents have a university, university degree and neither of them were doctors. I went to a state school that was in special measures so it wasn't doing too well at the time I was there. Um, I got GCSEs, they were somewhere between A star and C, mostly Bs. I remember getting that bit of paper with my results going, I can do better than that. Um, wasn't the best school, it was a sort of school where if you worked really hard, you'd get laughed at and, and bullied. So there wasn't a culture for kind of thriving for higher things. Um, and certainly no one ever told me I should be thinking about applying for medicine. It just wasn't an option at all. I then went on to do A-levels in biology, chemistry, maths and further maths. Um, I got A's in them. And one of, the, one of my things I hold dearly is that I've always worked part time to support my studies. So I've worked in pubs, restaurants and bars and I worked with the general public ever since I was 15, which was a big factor for me. Um, I then took a year out. I was meant to study maths at university and I didn't get in um, to that particular university. So I took a year out, I spent a year working, I did a little bit of traveling abroad and worked abroad. And then I went on to do a degree in pharmacology. After pharmacology, I decided I wanted to study medicine. Um, and first things first, I got rejected straight off the book. I didn't have the work experience. I didn't know the kind of rules of the game or the application. So then I got a job in healthcare, I sat entrance exams, I got volunteer work experience, which was really difficult because I didn't know anyone that was a doctor. I didn't know how to get work experience. We ha I had to kind of beg everyone I knew to see if they knew somebody who could get me some work experience. It was really challenging. I then got rejected again because I didn't meet the cutoff for the UK CAT exam at that time. So they wouldn't even consider the rest of my application, which was quite demoralizing. And it was at this point where my dad sat me down and said, maybe you're just not good enough. And that was a little bit demoralizing, but I, uh, I persisted. So then I set another entrance exam, the GAMSAT. I prepared for interviews. I got more work experience. I kept working on myself. And then I got rejected from two out of the three places I had interviews. Um, and I just, by skin of my teeth, got a place into graduate entry medicine. Um, so that's my story. So if you'd like to share a little bit about you, about where you're from, what your background is, that would be brilliant. It can be things like your schooling, your family background, the area what you're from, how old you are, where you are in your studies, if you think of applying for medicine, anything like that. Just share away. Okay, now we're going to go on to define disadvantaged backgrounds and obstacles to medical school. So what defines a disadvantaged background? How would you define it? And I'm going to ask you that. So again, just a little line about what you what it means to you to come from a disadvantaged background. You don't have to have the right answer, just kind of what, you, what springs to mind. I found it quite tricky to find a definition for what exactly it meant. I couldn't just find one kind of textbook answer. So what have we got? Somewhere that doesn't provide the same opportunities, not having equal opportunities, don't have the same resources. Someone who's had a break, per social background, coming from a working class area with low aspirations. Yeah, having to work harder or go through more efforts for opportunities and to do well given them. Yeah. A background that reduces your opportunities. Limited supply of access. A school with less funding, has less people that go to uni. Low income household from 
ethnic minority group not very well represented in society. If you have obstacles in your way, I think these are all really good. I think we're all kind of talking around a similar thing, but it just shows there is no one set definition. So I'm going to move on and show you one definition that I found that I think was quite nice. So this was written by someone called Jess, who was a medical student writing about what it was like to come from a, a disadvantaged background getting into medicine. And I thought her definition was quite good. It was quite inclusive. So she wrote, university applications from disadvantaged or non-traditional backgrounds often belong to low socioeconomic households or come from BAME backgrounds or both. Students with disabilities, students who are the first in their family to attend university, and mature students are also considered to be from non-traditional disadvantaged backgrounds. They are disadvantaged because various barriers exist which hinder their access to higher education. Students from low socioeconomic backgrounds often live in advantaged areas, attending low achieving schools and have little support navigating the university application process. I think that kind of summarises it quite well. Um, and now we move on to how this, dis this disadvantaged background, how does it relate to people applying to medicine? So this uh, data is from 2017. This was the last year that I could find data on. Um, so 50% of the medical school admissions, so that's people that got in in the UK, came from the most advantaged backgrounds. On the other hand, only 5% of medical school admissions were from the most disadvantaged backgrounds as well. That's a huge disparity. I think I saw another statistic that said that 80% of medical students come from 20% of the UK schools. There's just huge disparity. And then moving on into race, 42% of medical school admissions were from BAME backgrounds, which looks like it's heading towards being a bit more equal but then when you break it down, only 5% of medical school admissions in 2017 were from black ethnicity. And now this next statistic looks at once you're in medical school, what jobs do people go on to achieve? So the top doctors, the ones, uh, the people who are sitting on medical councils and things like that. Um, so 61% of them were from independent schools. And I just want to point out that only 7% of the UK is educated in independent schools. So for 61% of the top doctors to be from independent schools, it shows a huge disparity and underrepresentation. And the government did a report and they said that things were basically getting better, increasing diversity for gender, ethnicity and age, or perhaps not ethnicity when you look at the amount of people that are black coming into medical school. Um, but these improvements are not mirrored by similar changes in socioeconomic background. So there's still a class problem. And these are the references. So these obstacles that people are meeting, I think it was quite nicely summarized by David Johnson. So he's uh, the chief exec of Social Mobility Foundation. And they are a charity that look at kind of helping giving practical solutions to help people with social mobility for young people. And they wrote, young people from low income backgrounds often face barriers in terms of obtaining work experience, which they cannot get without connections, yet which plays a key role in applications. They attend low attaining schools, don't have their academic results placed in the proper context and in facing a complicated set of entrance procedures and aptitude tests, which are not monitored for by the impact of your socioeconomic background. And I think that's really important. No one's giving people context, you know, getting a B when you've worked really hard in a school that isn't that great versus getting a B when you've had a personal tutor and there's a support, are two different things that need context to be uh, assessed. So. This is a bit of a schematic that I came up with, which is simplified about how you get into medicine. So roughly speaking, you've got your grades, your work experience and your extracurricular activities perhaps, and they all feed in for your application, your personal statement. You might then do an entrance exam and have an interview and hopefully go on to get an admission in medical school. 
However, I think there's some things that we don't acknowledge that also play a part. One of them being confidence to apply. I think this is a huge factor in applying for medical school and not just in the application, but also at interviews and at things like that. Or if you do get rejected and applying again, it's a huge thing that affects somebody. And also, I just wanted to highlight some other hidden factors that play a role. So if you had a private education, or if you had links to healthcare professionals, or you might have had personal tutors, preparation courses, you might have had role models who are doctors that look like you, you might have had people encouraging you to do it, and money and time that are a luxury that a lot of us don't all have. And I think the way they impact your med school application is quite complicated, as I've tried to demonstrate, I think these all these things kind of feed into each other and underpin all these different points in the process. And there's no one way to kind of overcome all these hurdles. It is quite complicated. So what do you guys think? Have you guys had a similar experience of this? Do you, does any of this resonate with you? Do you, if, if so, please vote agree. Uh, if you're not sure if it applies to you or not, that's fine. And if you disagree, that's fine. If you haven't had these hurdles. Um, so it looks like at the moment we've plenty of people voted that most people agree. Uh, some people aren't so sure and some people disagree. So the majority, it seems that this audience have had similar experiences possibly. So ultimately, it seems like there's a bit of a broken system. It is unfair but the way it currently stands. And we need to work towards a fairer system for medical school applications and that are more equal, um, that promote equality. Um, and there are lots of positive changes being made. So there's lots of schemes, but I think ultimately more is needed. One example that I quite liked is some universities are starting to do what we call contextualized admission process, where they might take your grades into account of your circumstances or your background and have a different set of entry requirements for yourself. But I think we're a long way from it being fair. Uh, but until then, we will look at overcoming obstacles. So we're gonna to start to look at imposter syndrome. Now I think imposter syndrome kind of leaks into a lot of people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds or where there places where there's issues with representation and it's also a big thing in medical school so I think it's really important issue that we talk about. So firstly uh, what is imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome also known as imposter phenomenon which has been renamed as phenomenon because it just wants to it should be made clear that it's not an issue with the person who's experiencing it. It's not a syndrome or an illness. It's a pattern of behaviour. Um, so it's a pattern in which individuals doubt their skills, talents and accomplishments and has a persistent internalised fear of being exposed as a fraud. Uh, you might think you're not good enough, you only got this far by luck, or that everyone else is better than you. So has anyone had those experiences? Has anyone ever felt like a bit like an imposter? So it looks like a lot of people here also agree. There's one person that hasn't experienced it, which is brilliant. Um, cool. So we all relate a little bit to this. Okay. So what does this, how does this link with disadvantaged backgrounds? So the experts say that imposter syndrome is especially common among groups who experience social stereotypes about competence or intelligence. And that we feel when we're around people that look like us, have some more experience and backgrounds, we are less likely to feel like an imposter. And that feelings, feelings of imposter syndrome intersects with underrepresentation, bias and exclusion. And those things need to be tackled alongside individuals experiencing imposter syndrome as well. And that until we get these changes so that we can have inclusive and diverse spaces, Imposter syndrome is going to come out as a bit of a byproduct, really. So it's important to recognise that it's as much as there are things you can do about it, which we'll come on to talk to, it is kind of a product of the culture in which we live in at the moment. Okay, so imposter syndrome in medicine. 
So a recent survey found 97% of medical students experience moderate to intense feelings of imposter syndrome. So that's a lot of medical students, regardless of background. Most people feel like a bit of an imposter at some point. And I think they seem to think that it's because of the culture and, and nature of medicine courses. I mean, you're constantly being assessed and scrutinized and you're looking up to all your seniors who are so much better than you thinking, how, how am I going to do it? It's, it does kind of breed that thinking. And I think we get mistaken between going, am I in trained and I need to learn a bit more? Or am I an imposter and a fraud and I shouldn't be here? Well, we're not very good at kind of differentiating between those two. So what is the impact of imposter syndrome? Well, it makes you a sad puppy, essentially. Um, so if left unchecked, and if you don't recognise it within yourself and use some tools to overcome it, it can be really costly on you as the individual, but also the organisation that you're working for as well. It can make you procrastinate, uh, something I relate to very heavily. Um, and it means you might not get involved in activities, you might not share your ideas or anything like that. Uh, and you can kind of almost get into a cycle of self-sabotage and hold yourself back, which is something that you know, we don't want anyone to do. So how do you overcome imposter syndrome? Well, there needs to be some big changes so that there is more inclusivity. But as an individual, what can we do? So one of the big things that the experts recommend is talking about it, just acknowledging that it's a thing and that loads of people feel it and it's, it's almost normal to feel it. And then when you're getting those feelings of doubt and self-criticism, recognise them in yourself, stop and just try and reframe it. When, I'm, when I catch myself doing it, perhaps at work, I might be looking up to a consultant who's got 30 years more experience than me, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I don't know anything compared to them. I feel a bit rubbish. I should know more than this. And I stop and I go, instead of looking up, maybe I should just look, you know, metaphorically side to side at people at my level. I'm going, am I about the same as you are the people at my level? And it's normally yes. And I'm like, well, good. That's exactly where I should be. I just need to keep going. I'm meant to learn. I'm meant to be in training. It's OK. And the other tip is do it anyway. Do whatever you want to do, scared, nervous, full of self-doubt, do it anyway. Know that those feelings aren't based on anything real and that you are competent. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about setbacks. So what kind of setbacks do you think you might face when you apply to medical school? Or maybe that you have faced. The current competition ratios are 11 to 1, which means for 11 applicants, only one person gets a place. So the chances of you perhaps not getting in when you want to are reasonable. Um, and there's lots of, and there's so many different things you need to do, isn't there, these days? There's grades, there's work experience, there's interviews. I just want to see what you guys feel are going to be the things that trip you up. Well, not trip you up, but might set you back a little bit. So what have we got so far? Grade seems to be a big one. Work experience, not getting a lot of work experience. What else have we got? Time. This is moving too quickly. <laughs> so entrance exams, yeah, they're, they're quite difficult. Not having connections, not having extracurricular things. Imposter syndrome, yeah, it's a big thing. Lack of confidence. Money, interviews, competition. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of things. And I certainly faced a few. So what do you do when you, when you get set back? Maybe you don't get the grades, maybe you get rejected from interview, maybe you don't get your entrance exam that year that you want to. This is what I would advise you to, as someone who's faced many setbacks. Um, use it as an opportunity. You've just, you might have gained a year, um, when you can develop your skills. Um, so that might be your communication skills. If you fall down with confidence and at interviews, if that's for you, then you might want to work on that. You might want to learn some more. Maybe if your entrance exam requires some scientific knowledge, maybe you could go away and learn something. Maybe you could go and do a course that makes you more qualified. Or it might be an emotional skill. This might be one of the 
first big setbacks you face and being able to process that is a huge thing. Um, and it's a good discussion point at interviews, like being, you will be faced with setbacks as a doctor, I promise you. Uh, there's complaints, there's getting things wrong, there's making mistakes, there's failing exams, um, it doesn't stop. So if you can show to someone at an interview that you've, you know, you faced a setback and you were able to process it and move forward and learn from it, I think that would set you above other people. It's an opportunity to become more desirable. Go and do something, go and get some more experience, build up your CV, have fun. I went away and traveled a little bit once I got the funding. Um, so yeah, having those opportunities um, can be a real blessing. Uh, and just be careful what you make it mean. I think when we make a mistake, we try to get that self-talk of, oh, I'm a failure, it's not meant to happen, I'm not good enough. And it's just catching yourself and going, well, actually, I took a risk, I took a chance, I made a mistake, but I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm going to be ultimately become better from this. And just make sure you don't have too much negative self-talk. Okay, so what resources and options do you have? So there's loads of support available. Um, there's widening access programs, there's bursaries, there's scholarships, there's social mobility programs. There's loads of stuff out there that's really impressive um, that can help support you with work experience, personal statements, loads of things. I'll give you some links later. Um, other options are similar to mine. I did a graduate course, I went to do another degree and then applied for a four year course instead of five. And I can, you can still get that mostly funded in the UK through um, bursaries and things like that. But there's also other types of courses. So if you didn't quite get the grades you were hoping for, you can look at extended medical degrees and foundation courses, which are a bit longer, but they kind of allow you in and you do a couple of years and then you join the medical school later. So there is lots of options out there. There's always a way. Um, and these are some brilliant resources. So Generation Medics is a brilliant organisation that helps support people into medicine. They've got loads of things running. My Big Career does something similar. Social Mobility Foundation. It helps kind of from practical perspective, help with social mobility and young people. Medic Mentor links you with people who are already medics so they can mentor you. They also do uh, courses. They have research opportunities. They go into schools. They do awards, they do loads of things. It can really help you boost your CV in all those extra ways. Uh, Becoming a Doctor is a volunteer-led organisation that supports people who aspire to be doctors. They have a conference, they do blogs, they help you with entrance exams, personal statements, all that kind of thing. And then there's loads of local widening access initiatives, like there is in BSMS, the BMS, BSMS outreach team. So, overcoming obstacles, learning to sell yourself. So, when I was wanting to apply for medicine, I thought I had to look something like this. I thought I had to have perfect GCSEs, perfect A-levels. I thought I had to be really skilled at music and languages and have done the Duke of Edinburgh Award, be head pupil, and head of the hockey team and all these things. And it was really intimidating because I was like, I don't have any of those um, and I was like how am I going to sell myself I don't have any of these things that I think you need to become a doctor um, and I kind of learned to reframe what I had so I did have a large school so it just wasn't what I thought people were looking for but being able to reframe it and sell yourself is a really important skill especially when you get to interview so I was resourceful. I never had a private tutor or anything like that. I did a lot of teaching from YouTube and textbooks and things like that. I'm really resilient as a person. I've overcome a lot of failures. I've learned, I've moved forward. I'm quite relatable. I've, you know, I've had lived experience of some of the things patients have been through and I've got good communication skills. I've been working with the general public since I was 15. And I honestly think working in a pub and working in bars was probably the biggest asset to who I am as a doctor outside of my education because it just meant you just learn to communicate with everybody you've got to be able to make small talk and yeah being able to make people laugh is a lovely quality if you can just have a lovely down-to-earth approach 
when someone's very vulnerable, I think can make a lovely rapport with somebody and it's not something to be underestimated. And furthermore, I had jobs. I knew what it was like to work under pressure, to have to prioritise the to-do list, to work in a team, manage people and balance my time. These were all huge transferable skills and an asset. And, you know, I, I did some volunteer work as well. So I volunteered for helplines. So I was really good at listening with empathy and active listening, um, practicing signposting people to resources if they're particular vulnerability. And I also had volunteer work in teaching, which is a big thing within medicine as well. And one of the other things is I worked as a healthcare assistant in one of my years when I was in between rejections, um, which gave me lives of practical skills. I, I was very good at ECGs, phlebotomy, spirometry. So I got really skilled, which I still use to this day, some of those skills. Um, and I got an understanding of the NHS. I'd worked in it for a whole year, if not two. Uh, and I got to experience what it was like to be in other worlds because the people you work with the majority of the day as a doctor are hugely diverse. You've got nurses, healthcare assistants, porters, physios, and a lot of them aren't from the most, you know, advantaged backgrounds. And if you can communicate with them and treat them respectfully, that's a huge thing. And it's very important. Hey, congrats guys, we're almost there. Um, cool, so to summarize, we have talked about the importance of this topic and the need for a diverse healthcare team. And we've talked about practical solutions on overcoming obstacles and building confidence. And I really hope this has a positive influence on your application for your career and your support in widening access to medicine in the future. I'm just going to leave on this final quote, which is from Dr. Valerie Young, who is an imposter syndrome expert. And it's everybody loses when smart people play small. So play big. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You can either ask me on here or if there's any in the question and answer session, I'm happy to take them from there. Yep, it looks like we've had a had a few come through um, over the course of your talk, Charlotte, if we want to start with those. Uh, yeah. But if anybody else does want to pop um, pop them either in the Q&A or, yes, ask them on Menti, either way that that works. Um, so we've got a really good one here. Uh, what motivated you to persevere and keep applying to medicine? Um, what motivated me? Um, I think I knew I had the skill set. And I knew that it was the job that I wanted to go into. I knew I had all those skills. I knew I was terrible at convincing other people at it, but I knew I could get better at that. And I just knew how hard it was and how, you know, how unfair it is. It's so competitive. And if, you know, I have to keep reminding myself, I do have the skills, the numbers are just stacked against me. And I ultimately knew it was what I really, really wanted to do. And that there's no other career like that. Um, and just, yeah, there were some sad times, but just to remember that I did believe in myself. So yeah, that was that one. Uh, brilliant. There's a really good one here. Just just asking for your, your greatest piece of advice. What do you think your, your you know, top tip is, I suppose? Greatest piece of advice. Um, I would say practice your interviews with someone that scares you. That is a very good bit of advice that I got. Um, That's good. Yes. Yeah. Practicing interviews in general is always a good idea. Yeah. Uh, generally, uh, they are not not something you can blag uh, uh, an interview. Uh, um, looks like yeah. we've got one through the mentee as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me just minimize that one. How did you decide which universities you applied for? So I I wanted to do graduate entry medicine. So I looked at the universities that had those courses running. I then looked at uh, how many places they had. Realistically, where was I most likely to get in? And then after I'd done my entrance exam, so I did the UK CAT and the GAMSAT, I took a gamble because I didn't get the results from either on which one I thought had gone well. And I applied to those medical schools. And, uh, but I think... In hindsight, I would look at what type of interview process a university has. Um, I'd much prefer panel interviews. It's where I do much better. Um, that might be something you want to consider as opposed to mini multiple interviews. 
but yeah, have a read around and look at what med school works for you in terms of what you've got. Sometimes if you're doing graduate entry, you might want to look at if they'll accept a non-science degree or what they're, who they're likely to take. So yeah, I don't think it matters which university you end up at. You've just got to be a little bit smart about how you apply. How do I get work experience without any connections? Uh, I would look at some of the websites and resources that I linked you guys to. I think they have a lot of opportunities. Um, and if you have a local medical school, try and get in touch with their outreach team. Uh, Zach, do you have any experience on how people can get work experience? Yeah, so I think um, when as, as an admissions team, when we're looking at, at work experience um, from, from applicants, firstly, when it comes to sort of clinical work experience, what we're really looking for is that you have an understanding um, of, of medicine, of the NHS, that you understand what it's like to be a doctor and uh, what it's going to be like to work in that environment. Um, so this can be, I mean, if you can get some clinical work experience, that's great, but we also completely understand that it is very, very difficult to get this, especially at the moment uh, with COVID. Um, so there are some really good resources that you can use. Um, a bit of a self plug, uh, BSMS, we have an online uh, sort of virtual work experience that we we, we run um, that you can do to learn about lots of different areas of healthcare um, as well. So that's always a good one to use as well as the RCGP's online um, Observe GP program. Um, other than that, sort of other healthcare environments can be really useful. So sort of care homes or working with um, sort of younger people uh, in potentially a care or, or sort of education environment. Uh, those can be really useful. And then other than that, other than that sort of side of work experience, um, your main use of work experience is going to be showing the skills um, that make you suited to be a really good doctor. Um, so firstly, we'd always recommend have a little look at the NHS constitution and the, the key sort of skills that they say uh, all doctors could should have. These are things like communication skills, empathy, um, leadership and team working skills, all of these sort of things. And think about you know, part-time work that you do that shows these skills, volunteering work that you do, extracurricular activities that show these skills, um, and think about specific examples that you could use in, say, a personal statement, but also in your interviews. So say if a, an interviewer said to you, um, can you tell me about a time when you've shown really good communication skills? They're not just gonna, they don't just want you to say, oh, well, I shadowed in a GP surgery. What they want to hear is a specific example of a time where you yourself showed really good communication skills, what you learned about that, and then why that is going to be suitable uh, why that's made you suited uh, to be a, a really good doctor. Um, so work experience is a bit of a bit of a tricky one. And I think it is um, uh, misunderstood that you have to have loads of clinical work experience because, you know, in in medicine admissions teams completely understand that that is not uh, feasible for the vast majority of people. Um, what you can do is, you know, if you if you have a bit of the ability to travel, you can look a bit further afield, go potentially getting in touch with uh, GP surgeries a bit further afield or, or some hospitals might offer some uh, work experience. But it is quite tricky at the moment. And we completely um, understand that. Yeah, and I would just second it's not what you've done, it's what you've learned from it. Okay, what's the next one? What would you have done differently? Ooh, that's a tricky question. Um, I don't think I've done anything differently. I, I'm really proud of my journey and all my setbacks gave me amazing opportunities that, I would, that I've loved and have made me such a more rounded person, happier person, better doctor in my experience. Um, I don't think I'd have done anything differently. Um, but what would I advise someone else potentially? I think it would be before you apply, make sure you've be smart with your applications and get as much experience as you can. And I would have practiced my interviews more. 
Um, should we still try and apply for higher rent unis? Will they value the way we see ourselves the same? Uh, I don't know. I think all medicine, you, medical school courses are pretty much the same. You come out as the same doctor anyway. Um, they shouldn't really be looking at you from a different perspective, but I'm I'm not sure. Oh, I'll, I'll just jump in on that one for, yeah, for a second <laughs> in terms of in terms of uh, sort of any admissionsy sort of questions. Um, what I would always recommend when you're looking at the universities to apply to the ones that you're thinking of applying to, um, look very look at their entry requirements that's the that's the crucial thing um as as charlotte said over the course of the talk um it is very competitive there are a, a limited number of spaces that each university has um and so if you're not meeting the basic entry requirements that they're looking for um putting in an application to them is going to be a, a wasted choice um you can only on your ucas application you can only put down four medical schools anyway so make sure that when you're applying you're meeting the entry criteria um, for those medical schools. Um, for the most part, we'll also check their contextual data uh, and, and alternative or contextual offers they might be making um, because different universities might use different contextual data uh, markers. Um, so do have a look at those to see whether you meet those and whether you might be eligible um, for a contextual offer uh, as well, but you will still have to uh, go through the interview process, etc., before you're even made that offer. Um, so it is worth, you know, emailing their admissions teams if you're not sure. Um, please do, yeah, explore different universities and see what what they have to offer. So let's have a look. Uh, what are the disadvantages of graduate medicine? Um, disadvantages are that there isn't quite the same funding. Uh, I did this a few years ago, um, so forgive me if it's not the most up to date, but uh, graduate entry, the NHS will pay for the last three years, so it's a four year course, they'll pay for the last three years on the old fees, so they'll pay about three grand, and then you can get the rest of the six grand in uh, bursaries, but they won't pay that three grand for the first year, and the bursaries that you get are less on average. Uh, and it's harder to get into, I believe. It's much more competitive graduate medicine. Uh, it's much quicker, it's four year course, which is a good thing, but then you don't get things like your holidays, you'd get much fewer holidays. Um, but ultimately I'd recommend that I think it's a good thing. Um, uh, how do I? Uh, so what made me choose medicine over other allied healthcare professions? I think that's a really good question. Um, I personally chose it because I had a lot of scientific background. I'd done a degree in pharmacology and I really wanted that diagnostic part of the job. Um, I think the other healthcare professions are incredible and please, please do consider them if you are. And I think it's really important to think about what you want out of the job and what your skill set is because everybody helps people and everyone is working with people so you might actually find that something else lends itself more to you um but for me personally I thought it combined helping people those communication skills and that scientific element and I really wanted to be able to diagnose because I find it very interesting so that's why I chose a doctor over the others I'm wondering if I should try and pursue work experience in a dental practice. So if I want to apply to medicine, not dentistry, would doing work experience in a dental practice be worth spending time? I think if you want to apply for medicine, something more medicine is ideal. But if dentistry is all you've got, I'm sure there are things that you can take from that that are applicable. Um, but I would try and push for something a little bit more specific if you can. But if dentistry is what you've got. Uh, go learn from it, learn about patient encounters, learn about some drugs that they use, learn about some conditions. There's definitely stuff you could pick up there. Uh, what should you do for your application when you feel like you have nothing special or unique? I feel like I will get rejected pre-interview. Um, I'm sure you are more special and unique than you give yourself credit for. Uh, I definitely felt that way at times. And 
I still don't, well, we don't need, you know, a unique doctor. We just need someone who's got the skills. And I'm sure you do. I'm sure you've got loads of those skills. Talk to the people around you. Ask them what they would say. Get someone to help boost your confidence because, and give it a go. It sounds a little bit like imposter syndrome is kicking in here. So I think you can use the skills from tonight and just have a chat with yourself because I'm sure you have got what it takes. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that one again um, quickly. Um, in terms of uh, sort of pre any pre-interview uh, rejections, a lot of the time these will be basically down to um, entry requirements rather than anything about you specifically. Um, this might be, it, again, different medical schools use different ways of ranking things like your UCAT or BMAT scores. Um, they look at your GCSEs differently. They look at your A-levels differently. Um, so do make sure you understand when you're applying to a medical school what they want um, in terms of their entry requirements to give yourselves the best chance of getting to that interview stage. Um, things like the personal statement, for example, at BSMS, we don't read your personal statement because we we look at your your BMAT uh, in, as part of the BMAT. You have a written element. So we look at your written English as part of that. Um, and then we'll be looking at your your sort of A-level uh, grades, et cetera, um, as well as that. So it's not really at that point, up until the interview stage, we're just trying to get the number that we're going to bring to interview um, because we do get so many applications. Um, so at interview is really where you start to talk about yourself and your own experiences. Um, so do make sure you understand for the universities you're looking at what they want. Um, in terms of your your grades, uh, your UCAT or BMAT scores, um, what are they what are they basing uh, their selection on? And they will be um, very transparent about it. They want to make sure that you have the information to be able to make an informed choice. Um, so do explore different medical schools. Brilliant. So we've got just under under five minutes remaining. Um, so if there are a last couple of questions, uh, I suppose um, we have had quite a few uh, come in. Um, so uh, it, it's clearly been a very popular, uh, popular evening. Um, but yes, do feel free. Uh, I'll, I'll pop the uh, email up at the end of the talk. Uh, but do feel free to email us as well. The, the uh, outreach team here at, at BSMS, we're more than happy to answer some of these questions. Um, and if you have any uh, after tonight specific for charlotte i'm sure um we can forward those on uh, as well um so do feel free to, to ping those to us uh, but yeah we'll try and answer a, a, a couple more live before we finish up yeah i wish i could answer them all they're all really good interesting questions um, and i'm happy to answer any about email so yeah do forward them on um so what did i do to prepare for entrance exams um so i did the uk cat and the gamsat so for the uk cat I got a couple of books out to do practice questions and just practice and practice. And I believe on their website, they had some mock ones and I saved them up for my preparation and did them under exam conditions. And for the GAMSAT, which is a horrible exam, um, where you have to do some English literature analysis uh, for an hour and a half, which I'm still struggling to see how it's applicable. Um, and you have to write an essay, two essays in one hour, and then you do three hours of scientific reasoning of science, chemistry, biology, physics, roughly up to about university entrance level. Um, so I spent most of my time refreshing on my science knowledge. I spent a month or so uh, crashing at my mum's house, reviving, revising like crazy using the GAMSAT book. Um, and then I just hoped for the best. Um, I think it's quite tricky. Use the resources that are available to you. Check out some of the websites. Becoming a doctor has got some good links to entrance exam preparation material. Uh, is there anything I can do for work experience in GCSE? Uh, yes, um, I'm sure there is. Um, there's get in touch with your local accessing, widening access to medicine and see what experiences they can offer. There's virtual things going on at the moment, which are really good. There's, you might be able to organize something locally. You might be able to do some volunteer work. As we said, it doesn't have to be in a clinic, um, but there's lots of opportunities available. Just make sure you balance it out with getting enough rest for your studies. And 
Uh, I don't think I would have the courage to take a gap year after rejection and apply again. What advice could you give me? Um, yeah, it's it's really hard when you've been rejected. Um, and I think you do have to be a little bit brave to apply again. Um, I think ask yourself if you really want it. Is it worth this? And if you do, use that year to have some fun, to work on yourself, go and get some experience, maybe go abroad, get a job, work on yourself. I, those years were really hard at the beginning, but I wouldn't swap them for anything else. I think you can grow so much as a person. And, you, you know, if you get into medicine, you, that, your life is a doctor. It goes pretty quick. The, getting those experience to do something else are quite rare. So cherish them and use them wisely. Um, how did I find work as a healthcare assistant? Uh, ups and downs. Uh, some days were really, really good. I learned a lot. I was I spent a lot of time with patients, which was brilliant. You don't get to spend as much time with patients as you'd like as a doctor often. Um, and it was really humbling, actually. I thought it was so important because sometimes people who aren't doctors don't get treated with the same respect as, as they should do. And being that, having that experience, I will hold with me forever and make sure I never treat anybody the way I was treated in that disrespectful manner. So I thought it was vital. And I think more people should do it because it's um, really, really valuable experience. Brilliant. I think we might have to call that one uh, okay. the, the final question, okay. uh, Charlotte. I'm just going to pop some uh, slides up on the screen. Give me one moment. Uh, da, da, da. Let me just uh, put this up. OK, so you should be able to see that there. Um, so, yeah, like I said, if you do have any further questions after tonight's session, uh, do feel free to send us an email, uh, outreach at bsms.ac.uk. Um, if you do have any questions for Charlotte as well, send us send us one to there and we can forward that on uh, to Charlotte and hopefully get that back to you um, as well. Uh, tonight's session has been um, recording, um, so we will send out the, the recording of tonight's session to you, as well as some useful links uh, on stuff that has been touched on uh, this evening. Um, secondly, uh, we do run these every month. Uh, so next next month's uh, session is delivered by Alice Tunks, um, who is a PhD uh, researcher uh, at the medical school, all about perinatal obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so we do recommend, hey, if you want to learn uh, a little bit about that um, and, and her research uh, on that, we do recommend you come along to that one. And the final thing, uh, to, to plug to you this evening is uh, we have open days here at Brighton Sussex Medical School. Um, these are both on, on campus and online. Uh, so our first in-person open day for a couple of years actually uh, is on Saturday the 11th of June. Um, so we'll be there, uh, the outreach and admissions team will be there to answer any questions, but crucially um, our, our current students will be there as well to, to answer any questions about what it's like um, to, to study as a medical student, but also um, to help uh, if you have any questions about their application journeys. So I do recommend um, coming along to an open day, uh, whether in person or online, if you are looking to be applying to medicine in either either for 2023 entry or uh, 2024 entry or wherever you are in your application journey. In which case, thank you very much uh, for coming along this evening and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, thank you very much. Bye guys, thank you for coming.